I am very honored to have Adam Wiltsey, Director of Operations at Vanomatic in Delphus, Ohio. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks for having me, Noah. Yeah, this is awesome. I just sold Vanomatic uh, two Lyco CNC screw machines recently, and uh, that was really how I got to know Adam. And turns out that um, his company has uh, some really interesting things they're doing as far as um, employees and it fit perfectly with this season. So here we are. Um, and just to start, please give me a quick summary of Vanomatic so people just you know, know where we're coming from here. Sure. Uh, founded in 1954 by my grandfather. Um, we are third generation. My father, Jeff, Uncle Jim, and Uncle Perry were the second generation along with um, Trisha, uh, my aunt. And um, now, um, to uh, Jim and Trisha are retired and uh, Jeff and Perry are working their way out and they are um, handing over the reins to five new owners. Wow. Uh, so just give me a little bit about the company. Um, so you have about a hundred employees? Yes, uh, 103. 103 employees and um, your third generation, what kind of stuff do you guys make? So luckily we're pretty diverse. We, uh, we were in the automotive industry, about 25, 20 to 25%. Aerospace is 20, 25%. Fluid power is our largest sector. Um, ag construction, uh, that's that's in the 40% range. And then we, we have uh, our own Vanomatic fitting line of hose barbs and we do some refrigeration work as well. Wow, okay. So that's great diversification. Which sector has been um, the best lately and what's been the worst? So hydraulics, uh, fluid power, the construction and ag industry has been uh, really good. Uh, aerospace has fell off the face of the earth for the most part, uh, but they're creeping back. Um, automotive, um, you know, with the chip shortage, uh, we, we had three primary screw machines running automotive. We're down to two, uh, but the capacity's starting to uh, fill up there. Okay. And what kind of equipment do you guys have? So we are keeping, the majority of our equipment is engine five eights, VNA, Konomatic screw machines, eight spindles. Uh, uh, and then uh, we also have a couple New Britons and we now have 10 Lycos and two Trofeo, Eurotech Trofeos. Uh, hmm. And then a- <clears throat> what's, a what's a Trofeo? Is that like a twin spindle, twin turret or? Yep. Uh, main sub, uh, big machine. Big machine. Yep. Um, and for those people who aren't familiar with Konomatics, uh, they're sort of the same ilk as an Acme. Um, but uh, how would you describe it? Is, is the tool zone bigger on a Konomatic than an Acme? It is, and uh, they're just built super heavy. And uh, we kind of took something that was that was good and kept it alive. And uh, and the machines can push uh, feed rates like no other. Interesting. And uh, how many shops around you think are still using Konomatics? Very few. Uh, we're all in, we're all in a little club together, and there there's not a whole lot left. Mm -hmm. But you have no plans to, to phase them out. We just bought four uh, additional Konomatics 
um, basically, you know, pretty, pretty low price scrap value almost, and we are rebuilding them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, okay. So you're doing high volume work, lots of different sectors. Um, all right. Now give me, uh, give me your two minute life story. Okay. Um, that's tough, but I'll give it a shot. Um, so well, I, if I, I, if I tell people to give me a 10 minute life story, it might turn out to be 20. So two minutes right. might turn out to be five and that's acceptable. So I guess I would go off of, uh, the major influencers, right? Um, growing up with my mom and dad, uh, they taught me a couple things, uh, work ethic and you can do everything yourself. Uh, you know, uh, from construction to anything. Um, we didn't look outside very often. Uh, if we were going to build a volleyball court, we got the post hole digger out. We, uh, oh, we're totally different. We were just like, yeah. Um, call the neighbor, call the, <laughs> <laughs> right. call the professional. <laughs> so you guys are do it yourselfers. We are do-it-yourselfers, and uh, that you know that was my dad's major influence. And my mom is her work ethic is like no other. Um, she's fantastic, um, and so I grew up with that, and that was a good foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. Went to college for engineering at University of Dayton, and met my uh, wife Kate, um, and she brought a a wonderful influence of observe and improve. We don't have to settle for the way things are. Uh, mm. You can make it better. Um, break down some barriers. Look at look at things fresh. Um, it's so okay. if it's not right, work on changing it. Um, she, so that's helped with a lot of personal growth. Um, she doesn't and work then, in the business, does she? She does not. She's a school teacher. Uh, but she's been she's been with me, uh, you know, the entire career I've had here at Vanomatic, and uh, uh, a tremendous influence on uh, me personally. And you're uh, you're how old? Forty two? Is that what you tell me? Forty three. Forty three. And uh, got three kids, Lucy. Blake and Clara, 14, 12, and nine. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the, th the third major influence for me personally is uh, there's these three kids that Kate and I have, and then they're all so different and unique and um, kind of helps direct management style a little bit and understanding uh, people are different and unique and mm -hmm. there isn't a collective way to do things you must modify that is very astute uh so you know through college i i came directly into vanomatic uh, in two, 2000 so i've been here 21 years and i started in engineering started tooling up jobs got into some machine design uh, one significant and and we'll get into the team uh but and maybe i'll get into the team right now sure so uh this attitude of i guess not having barriers uh, i came into the engineering department and it was pretty well vacated it, it was it was there to build and mm -hmm. um so we were in this upstairs office and my cousin, Dave Ricker, who is now uh, one of the ownership group, um, I say, Dave, I need 3D modeling software. I'm like this 2D is not gonna cut it. And this is in 2001 maybe. And uh, Dave is an IT wizard. Mm -hmm. So at that time it was fairly easy to uh, uh, acquire software fairly quickly and uh well you're, you're grinning as you say this are, are you are you saying that that um maybe there was a, a nice like 
BitTorrent site that you might use it's or something? Possible. It's, it's possible we, we hacked some 3D software to evaluate which one. Uh, yeah, you got to try it out. Right. So uh, Katia and SolidWorks and Solid Edge and, and uh, there's one thing about my, my dad and my uncles is you bring them an idea and you, you can expect that you're going to hear no. Uh, <laughs> so um, it must be proven out. So Dave and I work some magic and I start designing uh, sheet metal and different items in 3D and, and uh, said, look what this look what this software can do. And that sold them. They, we bought the software and we've owned it since uh, 2001. And that really kind of opened the door for a lot of our innovation, um, hmm. which, which is all piece of the puzzle. Uh, so uh, Scott comes into the picture next. So he's, he's my brother. And, uh, so where are you in order of age? So I'm in the middle, Jared's the youngest, Scott's the oldest. Um, and Scott was working on the floor. He, he was running screw machines, second op, and uh, he went to school for human resources communications. So he came into the company and um, started putting systems together for people hmm. um, and employees. Um, so uh, Steve Schrader, he, he started out at Vanomatic before we did and, uh, took a little hiatus, uh, but he started, he was the sole engineer and, um, uh, and he came back to the company, back to the engineering role. And then he has navigated into sales, which, uh, if you ask me, you, you can't have a more perfect, uh, person in sales with the engineer engineering background he knows how to how we manufacture he understands cost um so i was i was this brings me to a question um i've been you familiar with um a guy named david epstein he wrote a book called the sports gene and range and it's all about cross training it sounds like you guys sort of um embrace this at least for your family members uh as far as if you do several different things it'll come together and help you in some other thing um you you kind of like build muscles in one thing and that helps in something else do you say that's something that you guys think about absolutely uh we're gonna we're gonna tap into that i'm sure um that's a, a core piece of our entire foundation. Um, one other team member, my, my younger brother, Jared, uh, he brings to the, the team the expertise on uh, uh, screw machine manufacturing and CNC. So it's a perfect blend of the two. Um, okay, I, I wanted to make sure I, I fit that in. Uh, yeah, so. great. Um, Okay, so you have a um, hundred and three employees. You said, yeah. Yes, we're at the highest level of employment in company history. Oh, wow. Okay, and right now, business is going very well, and record pace first half um, numbers we've never seen. Okay which is like, you know, some of our other customers are saying similar things, but the other thing we're hearing from everybody is I can't find enough people. This sucks because I have all the work I could ever want in the world and I can't find the people to, um, to do it. So what are you guys feeling out there? We haven't, had that experience uh and there's reasons for that um and i can go into that that's what i want to that's that's what we what i want to focus on in this podcast is okay. i mean there's lots of really cool stuff we can talk about and 
um, probably have to have you on again. But I want to, I want to really focus on this specific thing. Why is finding employees not a big problem for you at the moment? So uh, a lot of people go straight to wage rate and that's, that's one very important, but uh, almost irrelevant piece of the pie for us. Uh, Now it's important to everybody and you must be competitive. If you're not competitive on wages and you, you don't show progress and you don't show improvement through the years, uh, you might as well stop there. Do you mind telling me what your wages are? You don't have to. So I won't give you a per hour rate that wouldn't do it, uh, justice, but Mm -hmm. we have, some of our uh, skilled guys on the on the shop floor, they're they're making seventy to sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. Okay. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of great benefits um, to go along with that. A lot of vacation time, a lot of PTO. Um, How long would it take to be at the company to be making sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year? And I'll also sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year in in Delphus, Ohio is, it's probably like a hundred thousand dollars a year in Chicago. Would you say that's true? Yes. Cost of living here. It's a fairly small town population, 6,000. Um, uh, the largest city around us is Lima. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fairly good wage for the so area. 6,000 people are in the town. You've got some surrounding towns yet you don't have that much trouble finding people for for your shop um all right i'll stop interrupting you continue (laughs) so step number one you must be competitive on wages now uh uh we're there uh and everybody wants to make more you want to make more i want to make more there there isn't you know that's that's taken for granted right everybody would like to make more money Mm -hmm. but if if a company is competitive then it's the the other items so um flexibility is a large large thing at banamatic and um i'll just give you a breakdown how we operate every two weeks we sit down we have a two-week strategy meeting we look our customer demand and we evaluate uh by department uh, what kind of labor hours we need and what kind of machine hours we need. And we will generate a window of hours uh, to be worked. So currently uh, for everybody in the shop, except for our primary production operators, we're operating under 35 minimum hours to 50 maximum hours. Okay. So uh, this kind of goes back to now I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, the primary production operators, because um, uh, our inventories are a bit low, we're on 45 to 60. So any employee, uh, any title can work a minimum of 45 hours up to a maximum of 60 hours at their discretion outside of any approval from any supervisor uh, or even me, director of operations. Uh, they have the choice, they have the ability to uh, work within those ranges with, uh, um, with no expectation to do anything otherwise. That is so interesting. And my assumption is, well, I don't know. What, 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 do, you, what do you find the pattern? People on the bottom end or more on the top end or? So, this kind of goes back to some of the influences, the parenting influence uh, you got, you know, uh, and this goes for the whole team. We're all in agreement. Um, um, I have three kids. They're all so uniquely different. One's a, you know, one wakes up first thing in the morning. Two of them like to sleep until 10 or 11. Um, that's it's no different with the employees. Uh, they all have different habits and structures and, um, and they're into different things. They're into different sports. They coach. They're in uh, 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 
their teachers, the wrestling coaches, they they have you know side things going on. Their kids are involved, so. But they're all um, they're all still talented, so you all want them rather than having to just fit them into your to a, a rigid schedule. Well, and maybe it would be best stated uh, where we started was four tens and an eight, uh, regardless of of conditions. Uh, you work four tens and an eight night shift, day shift, and that's the way it works. You come in at seven, you check, you clock out at 5.30 and Friday you get uh, a shorter day, eight hour day. You come in at seven and you clock out at 3.30 and your, your lunch breaks are on the buzzer. And, um, and that was probably 15 years ago, we abandoned that system. Mm -hmm. So now we give general guidelines. Uh, day shift has to start after 5.30 in the morning, and night shift has to start after 3.30 in the afternoon. And throughout the week, uh, they can put their hours in how they see fit, up to a maximum of 12 hours and a minimum of a five-hour shift. So, um, you know, we don't want uh, people coming in, working two hours and leaving. So we've established, and uh, after 12 hours, there's, there's a bit of a burnout uh, that we want to prevent. So could you work five hours one day and then 10 hours a different day? Or is he, do you need like kind of the same thing each day? Uh, guys come and go as they, as they need to and as they please. And uh, you can imagine the challenge in, in that, with that. I, I can walk out on the floor right now and not exactly know who's going to be there but we don't manage the people. They manage themselves. We manage the work that needs to get done. Uh, and we manage the work that needs to get done so well, everybody always knows what's going on. So do, does one employee have to talk to another one and say, hey, I'm not gonna be here that much today. You're gonna have to pick up the slack for me. Or do you have enough redundancy that you don't have to worry about that? So uh, there's, there's that mutual respect piece and everybody kind of knows how this works. So uh, we start on Sunday night at 3.30. It's gonna be a skeleton crew. Uh, it's gonna be maybe half a night shift. Uh, Monday, we're gonna have a full day shift all the way through Thursday and then Friday around 10 or 11, not many people are gonna be left. So it's the, the start of the week and the end of the week. Thursday nights, uh, you know, it's, it's about half the night shift and people are putting in fewer hours, but through the middle of the week, some guys will work 10, some guys will work 11, some guys will work 12s. Um, there's don't a lot of guys. Have, don't you have so much work right now though, that if you could, if, if you could, you'd want people to work full days on Friday. I mean, do you, or, or you're just kind of like, this works, whatever we're doing just works and the customers can wait. So um, that's a big uh, topic also. Our, our customers actually came to us and demanded that we implement uh, a minimum 56 to 60 hours. Ah, interesting. And I told them, no, um, we are playing the long game. We are not going to burn out our employees, and we are uh, we're going to operate with our own values, and um, we are going to prevent turnover of skilled people. And the the cost of not having employees that want to work at your company is is far greater than um, upsetting a customer. <clears throat> sure. And, and you're going to upset them even more if you drive your employees away. Wow. So do you guys have people that come from other shops because they're unhappy with their lifestyle there? Uh, yes, we've had several. Um, and a lot of it comes down to mandated overtime. Sure. Uh, and even with our customers, they're, they're experiencing 
15, 20, 25% turnover. Uh, there's employees going to doctors, getting doctor's notes in order to not work the mandatory overtime. Yeah, right. So you're mandating this extra time and then you're not even getting the full output put out of it and you're making people unhappy. So yeah, that doesn't sound like a very good um, recipe. Uh, but what if you want to grow and get more work? Um, uh, from 2016 to 2021, we've uh, doubled in, in sales and uh, value output. Um, so we are growing. We're growing, uh, you know, we're, we're at the highest employment level ever. Uh, and we deliver to our customers. We are probably one of the, the premier suppliers to our customers. And it's this Banamatic first mentality that is the greatest benefit for the customer. Uh, Interesting. But it's a long-term uh, gain, not a short-term week-by-week gain. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a much different viewpoint and, uh, you know, we've got a lot of tenure with our employees, uh, average tenures of 15 to 17 years. Um, this brings me some, something else that we, we had, had talked about, um, so you have a tenure, average tenure, you told me 17 years. Okay, 15, 17 years. However, also you, um, you value uh, a lot of employees that are gonna come and go, like young people, maybe they're part-time, maybe, you know, it, it almost sounded like, you know, you hear in white collar jobs where people know that they're like a stepping stone. Somebody's gonna come there, they're gonna work two, three years, and then they're gonna go back to business school or go go somewhere else. Um, do you guys have something like that as well? Absolutely, we have uh, a large part-time component. 14 of the 103 employees are part-time. Um, what does part-time mean? How many hours is that? They're under the same statutes as everybody else so 35 to 50 or uh, you know 45 to 60 if they're on the primary machines um now if they're part-time though what's the least they could work we're very flexible if they're if they're a student at, at one of the local colleges you know we'll work with them they um it could be like 10 hours it could be 10 it could be 15 it could be 20 um so it it there's a large range in what people do. So you're pulling people from local colleges. Um, you, you're involved in, in high school um, recruitment to some extent? So yes, uh, we currently have nine uh, employees from Vantage Career Center, which is a high school uh, Career Center, and we have uh, four from UNOH, which is a low uh, two-year college in Lima. And um, and Lima is right nearby. Yep, twenty minutes away. Okay. So, uh, and these these guys are great, uh, fantastic, and m many of the uh, the guys from Vantage are full time now, and. Um, through summer help, we'll pull in. Um, I sit on the robotics advisory board at UNOH and um, Steve and Scott uh, sit on the uh, precision manufacturing at Vantage. Okay, board. UNOH is, that's higher education? Yes, that's the two year uh, tech school. And people are pulled from where? Mainly Ohio? Uh, we've. We had guys working at from Arizona, Maine, Texas, uh, all over the country. They, and they that's come. nearby? Yeah, that's in Lima. People come all the way from Arizona to Lima, Ohio? Oh, yeah. Because, 
but why? This is just known as a place if you're interested in manufacturing, manufacturing, engineering. What are they studying there? Robotics, diesel uh, engines. They have a racing team. Uh, it's a big draw for uh, mechanically minded people. So this is, this is just an advantage, uh, a blessing that you have being so close to this place. Correct. It's a luxury in a way. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of shops are, which is so interesting because you're in a town of 6,000 people and I'm assuming Lima isn't, I mean, it's not huge. So you're in a spot with not a lot of people, yet you are pulling from like a nice concentrated group of people that are interested in what you guys are doing. Yes. And they need the flexibility and we offer the flexibility. They can't come in and, you know, punch a clock from this time to this time. They need to kind of come and go as they. Right. Because they, they're students. They're students. They have a test on Friday. They can't come in on, you know, Thursday. So uh, we work with them very well. And, um, that is so, that is so interesting. You're the first person I've talked to like that. I mean, other people talk about people interning or apprenticeship or, but that, you know, I guess it goes well with your flexible system. And is this something that really helps attract younger people? It does. Um, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even say younger people. I'd say all people. Um, yeah. Uh, it's time. You know, time is like the most precious thing we have. And as you right. said, the money is pretty good, but like time is the one thing you can't get back. You can always make more money. Right. And you know, when you have that choice, if you know, there's competitive wages, in, but you have all this flexibility, that's, that's why we get longevity. And, um, uh, you know, and treat our employees good we you know consistently and uh put through wage increases uh add additional benefits right. um you know the success of the company goes to the entire company and i think the employees truly believe and know this and uh, trust this mm -hmm. and um and was they, it hard they, was it hard to make this change was it hard to get your to get the, the previous generation to, to adopt this? And what, what caused you to come up with this idea? I mean, it's, did, so, did, did you try to emulate another company you saw? So now we're getting to the influence, right? Like we, we observe and improve and, and we're observing and um, we're questioning, like, does it have to be this way? Um, and can we change it? Can we make it better? Um, and of course, you know, there's been influences from other PMPA companies. Uh, a, a good one that prompted a lot of this was, uh, Jeff Olemacher. Oh, um, okay. Very, very, very astute guy. I think once upon a time, I tried to get him on the podcast, but he, he's a tough guy to reach. Really, really smart guys. He won't even remember this. Uh, but. I, we're sitting, we're sitting in the lounge at a PMPA event, and I overhear him talking about this process he's doing in his company, and it was called Start, Stop, Improve. And uh, you know, and it, and this is me eavesdropping. Uh, I'm not even part of the discussion, but uh, we we take start stop and prove and me and my brother scott sat down with every single employee for about five years in a row and we asked them on a company level uh what would you start stop improve uh a department level in an individual level wow and this is coming off of the you know the the four tens and an eight era and they wow they put us back in our chairs they said you know they told us everything they were open they were honest and we logged and logged and logged all all the uh the comments no oh, um, that is that is so cool and so um 
Olamak. Wait, it's John Scott Olamacher. No, Jeff. Jeff Olamacher. So Jeff Olamacher was talking about um, getting feedback from the employees. That was where you got the idea from. Correct. Okay, so it wasn't the idea of the flexible hours. It was the idea of getting feedback from the employees. Correct. Um, and so this was one of the top things that you said, what was on your wish list of if we could do anything that would make your life better? And they said flexibility. There were a number of things, uh, our communication processes, our uh, scheduling systems, our, and yes, flexibility. Uh, uh, I don't, you know, I've got all this going on and, and some of it was just knowing the employees, knowing what they were involved in, re constant requests for, hey, you know, I want to coach but I need to coach at three o'clock. Um, this is going to be tough. Uh, yeah. so, um, we also had a local company, um, that was testing the waters with flexible hours and, and, and we kind of stole some ideas from them as well. And basically one day we said, you know what, business is down. I think it was 2009. And, uh, you know, the recessionary period. Right, it's down for everybody. Right. We are working 48 hours regardless because that's what we did and that's what we always did. So we simply put out, hey, guys, um, you can work a maximum of 48, but you can work down to 40 if you want. And that first week, it was like, we can do what? Uh, and you're doing what? And uh, we're like, we I mean, because you kind of wanted them in, in a way you kind of wanted them to work less because you didn't have the work. Right. And it was almost necessary at that point, uh, to scale back. And, you know, we're like, let's just make it optional. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, week after week after week of doing it, we've never looked back and we've learned uh, a lot along the way. Well, talk about what you did recently during the pandemic because it sounds like it was a little bit like that but on a much greater scale sure so of course um at one moment we thought we were going to completely close down um and then we quickly started getting uh, so what are you talking about like maybe april of 2020 yes May? okay Yep. As soon as, you know, the states started taking actions and, um, uh, you know, we were, we were talking to each other that, okay, we're going to have to shut down and see how this goes. And then the customers, uh, started calling and sending letters and, uh, uh, we are an essential supplier. So, uh, we stayed open. Uh, of course, you know, the sales took a giant downturn. Uh, we, in May of, uh, 2020, we were down 50%. Wow. And at that point we told the employees, um, you can work zero hours up to 50, 50 hours. So if you're not comfortable working, don't work and we'll help you sign up for un unemployment and take the kicker. And, um, you know, it's, in their people, interest. you mean you mean if people if people didn't feel comfortable health wise, health wise, mm -hmm. um, any pre existing conditions, maybe their uh, children were at home, they needed right. to watch them. Yeah, correct. So completely optional, zero to fifty, and uh, for about four weeks, we had probably thirty to forty percent of our staff that worked. And, and you even, you even helped, you even helped people get the government assistance, correct? Scott, uh, uh, director of human resources worked with them, uh, whenever they needed to sign, help them sign up and got them government assistance, uh, throughout the whole process. Um, uh, that is so interesting. So you could keep somebody like on the books as your employee, yet they could still get the government assistance? 
Well, they went on unemployment. Uh, we signed them up and they did not work. Right. So they weren't actually like tied to the company anymore. They were just sort of, you kind of had like an informal, like agreement, you know, not agreement, but I guess you, it sounds like you guys were confident that they would want to come back when it was time. Right. And really, it, you know, at the time, we did, we had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, we just we we knew that you know sales uh, was was cut significantly. We knew there was uh, a lot of concern about the pandemic, um, and so we instituted the flexibility, all the uh, cleaning protocols, and uh, after that four week period. We, we applied for the PPP money. And then, um, you know, as is the Vanomatic way, we uh, gave all the employees that worked those four weeks a 27% bonus on their wages um, for that time period. So the people that, that stayed got extra incentive. Correct. And then from that point Even on, though you didn't, even though really, would you say at one point you didn't want everybody to stay? You, you, that would have been difficult for you if everybody stayed and you had to give them 27% increase. Correct. Uh, we wouldn't have had anything to do. Uh, there would have been no machines to run because we couldn't afford to uh, build inventory. So, so why, would, why would all these people um, accept the layoff or accept the decreased hours when they knew if they kept on they could get the 27 percent increase and maybe their families were suffering and maybe i don't know so the it just kind of worked out that way and the, the 27 percent was a decision we made later on adam oh, okay. okay i'm back right. you're back you're back okay you said the 27 percent was something you made later on that was a decision made later on, um, you know, through the whole PPP process. So that was awarded after the fact. Um, but um, there was some competition to, you know, once uh, once things started picking back up, there was some competition uh, competition with the federal assistance. So we uh, we implemented a five dollar an hour on top of their regular wages uh, incentive to work. So like, cause everybody's complaining, uh, how am I supposed to compete with that, with the government assistance? How am I supposed to get people back? And so you just said, you know, pay them enough that it makes sense for them. And plus they like you guys. So they wanted to come back. Right. Basically and that. Absolutely. And basically they, you know, the layoffs were voluntary and the, most of our workforce said, hey, if you need me, I'll come back. Just let me know. Wow. So we navigated fairly well through, you know, through the, the big drop and then the, uh, the return. Mm -hmm. what, what, what advice would you give for companies right now uh, who, I mean, I, I guess the government assistance is ending unless all of a sudden <laughs> things things go backward who knows what's going to happen but you know a lot of these people are a lot of these companies are feeling depleted um is there is there any is there anything they can do that's quick um make sure their wages are competitive that's like step number one uh, second step is understand that uh, uh, Americans are very in individualistic. Um, mm. And if, if you're operating your company as a collective unit, all under the same structure, hours, uh, system, you're not going to satisfy everybody. And the people that are not satisfied are going to be the ones that leave. Wow. That is really, really interesting. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, 
what what uh what was the highlight of this week oh boy besides getting besides getting interviewed right um this week was the largest uh breakdown uh in our central chip system that the company has ever experienced (laughs) oh so that's the highlight um our our uh, our chip system it's a central system and on sunday night at 10 p.m i walk back and uh look at our reservoir that holds 14,000 gallons of oil and there was no oil in it it was in our containment pit mm. and uh we knew at that point that uh we had uh, a hole in our extractor unit and it was buried in a six foot deep pool of oil wow so um we executed very well to uh remove the oil find the hole patch the hole fix the hole put everything back together and as of yesterday at 6 p.m we were back to full pr- production so the low light and the highlight yes it, but so the, that's interesting to me because n- you're making me think of something like if a company has a central chip system like you're really screwed if that one goes down versus if you just have chip conveyors on each machine, like it's not a big deal. This is the only time in, you know, we've been in this building since 2003 that we've had this uh, major of a uh, failure and it was a fluke. Um, A, uh, a a weld broke on a large three inch piece of angle iron and Uh, curled down through our screw conveyor and jammed a hole straight through our extractor base at the lowest level of uh, of our chip system and uh, you're right there are challenges with the central central systems but boy are they net they are very nice Uh, it's not good it's not good for resale of machines (laughs) it's when you buy a machine and it doesn't have a chip conveyor it's always a pain in the butt just so you know all of our machines have chip conveyors. Oh, they do. Yes. Um, we just, uh, we direct the chips from the back of the machines into our chip system. My father uh, designed the building uh, in order to be very, very efficient for uh, chip handling. So like on your cones, I mean, this is a total tangent, but is there a, a hole in the bottom of the base of your cones? Nope. We have oh. a regular regular screw conveyor that directs the chips out the back of the machine. They go through a sheet metal chute that goes either into stainless or carbon, and they travel 240 foot to the back chip processing room, and nobody touches the chips. They, uh, they're they spun oh. out and put in some silos. Trucks come so in. So it's a combination of like the regular chip conveyors and then those regular chip conveyors push them into the big system correct oh that's cool um so what's uh what was something that um i mean this this is sort of in the same uh category but you know what's something you learned um last week so uh you know so we communicate very frequently and very transparently and very openly. So every day uh, around nine in the, or yeah, around nine in the morning, uh, we put out a progress report update for production and just add some notes on what the company's doing. Um, we've built a, uh, a Vanimatic business manager that uh, extracts all the information you can imagine out of our ERP system, Henning Industrial Software, which we love. I got to throw that plug in there. Yeah, no, uh, I, that uh, you mentioned that before. The ERP system is really that's really been helpful. Yes, so we, you know, the interface on top is is another piece of transparency, which is a completely other conversation. But um, that's what we do. We observe and improve. Improve. Uh, that's that's our culture. So uh, we have five items that are going to make us a lot better company coming out of this breakdown that are going to resolve our issues uh, permanently. Uh, 
Man, so, you totally have your shit together. These I'm, are you, opportunities. You, you make me feel. You make me feel like, oh my god, we're a mess. <laughs> uh, you know, it's great. Vanomatic stands by Unity Empowerment Teamwork, and it's not just the tagline. It's it's the real deal. Um, through this, you know, we have these oil supply lines that feed the machines with oil, and because of our breakdown, the oil main oil pumps uh, picked up a bunch of shavings and they clogged this line. So, you know, we spent two days cleaning this line out and it was very tough physical work and our maintenance crew and our material handling crew are fantastic. But uh, one of the guys, uh, John Munoz says, we need, we need a valve and uh, we need, we need to do regular PM on this. And of course, you know, I jump in, I start cutting him off. He's like, no, come on. And I just had to shut up and listen for a minute. He's like, let's do this. Let's, let's improve the system. So, you know, we save the wear and tear on ourselves. And so wow. that was one of the, one of the five items is the John valve that's going to clean these systems out, you know, uh, on a regular basis. And John's going to lead it and he's going to work with an outside company to design and, and build it and retrofit it. Um, so that, that's the empowerment piece that we look for every opportunity. Is he in, uh, he's part of the management team or? No, he's part of the maintenance crew. He right, is, so uh, he just, he just took ownership. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Rodney Wagner, James Cooley, John Munoz, uh, Jake Lyons. He's a new guy that, um, uh, Matt Weaker, you know, these guys are the guys that, uh, and I'm sure I'm, I'm, Def, uh, definitely forgetting people don't worry it's not it's it's not like your your oscar uh right or something like <laughs> but um the point is they they got us up and running again and they did it voluntarily they put in 70 hours they you know did what they needed to do and um because they care wow well um i think i think that pretty much sums it up well and um do you have anything else to say to the people of the world um no uh i other than um i guess people deserve uh deserve their time and they sh the, their job is not their life. Um, try to find the work-life balance.